Hey guys, I'm going to go ahead and do a reaction video to the two videos that were just posted by that new channel. But I want to start off by saying I don't trust that channel creator at all. I think there's a whole lot more to the story and I think her timing is very interesting. If you knew what I knew, you'd be very concerned about her timing suddenly deciding that she needs to, you know, come out with all of the stuff that she supposedly knows that nobody else knows. So far, she hasn't said anything at all that we haven't already been discussing for over two years straight. I think it's very fishy, and I think it's really the first time in over two years where I've begun to question just what's going on with this case. I mean, I've had a lot of questions over the last two years, don't get me wrong. But seeing what she's doing with her channel and seeing how the Watts are jumping right on board, well, it makes me question a lot of things over the last two years. Most of all, the timing. Why it is that suddenly Kim felt that it was time for her to speak out. Because something that you guys don't know is there were high profile lawyers considering taking the case. So isn't it interesting that the Watts would choose now after two years to take part in something that, to me, seems pretty obvious would hurt their chances of ever finding any lawyer who would want to get involved with their son's case. Kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it, why it is that they would suddenly jump on YouTube. Interesting. So let's take a look at those videos. There were two of them, part one and part two. And they started off with Ronnie Watts telling Kim that he supports her channel 100% and that he believes in what she's doing. Of course, we're not really sure what it is she's doing, right? And I'm not sure that he's sure either because anytime anybody asks Kim that question, she avoids having to answer it. The simple question, what is your goal, was asked literally over 100 times in a recent live chat. And she never did answer that question. But I think those of us who do know a little more about the backstory are pretty clear on what her answer would be if she were to be honest about it. Ronnie talked about how they went down to the beach, you know, the trip to Myrtle Beach, and how they were just five miles apart and how his daughter-in-law wouldn't allow them to see the grandkids. I think it's interesting in the case of Christopher Watts how Ronnie Watts is saying that his daughter-in-law wouldn't allow it, but he isn't saying that his son didn't stand up so that he could see his grandkids. I think that's just interesting. I think Christopher Watts' wife was absolutely terrible for not allowing her in-laws to see Bella and Cece, but I also think Christopher Watts was terrible too. Ronnie Watts went on to talk about how the day before they left to go back to Colorado, that Christopher Watts went to see his grandmother and then he came over to the house and spent the afternoon with them. And they had a cookout and had a good talk. And Christopher Watts told him that he and his wife were getting divorced, that he was looking for an apartment, a two bedroom, and then he was ready to move on with his life. 
He also told him that the house was already on the market, that it was for sale. I thought that was interesting since it wasn't. Ronnie Watts talked about the letter and he said that the reason for the letter that Christopher Watts had written was because of, quote, the way that his daughter-in-law had been acting. And then he talked about the two tiffs that his wife and his daughter-in-law had. The first one was the first weekend she was there and supposedly while Cindy went to get her hair done, their daughter-in-law burned up the phone upset because she was left alone with the kids. He tells the story that she said that she was left alone with the kids for five hours. Cindy Watts tells the story that it was less than one hour later that she called her and said, who's going to take care of these kids? Well, Ronnie in this interview said that it was three or four hours later and that it wasn't Cindy that she was calling, that it was actually him. And she said, quote, let me find it here. I wrote it down. Oh, I thought I wrote it down. Oh, yes. She said, quote, that Cindy had, quote, left me alone with these kids for five hours. Well, which is true. Because Cindy and Ronnie are telling two totally different stories. So what's that about? I'll repeat it. Cindy said that after less than an hour, after she left to go to the hair appointment, that her daughter-in-law called saying, you know, who's going to take care of the kids? And Ronnie's telling the story now that it was three or four hours later and that Cindy didn't even have her phone on her. He said that she left it at the hair salon and that his daughter-in-law was burning up his phone and that she said something totally different, although, you know, the same general gist, but still, I mean, that's something you'd remember, isn't it? Quote, she left me alone with these kids for five hours. Well, Again, why the discrepancy in their stories? And then in the interview, Ronnie went on to talk about how the Frederick PD was calling Christopher Watts and they kept losing the phone calls. The calls kept dropping. I think they were in the car after he picked him up, after Christopher Watts picked up his dad from the airport. And that during that time frame, Christopher Watts said to his dad, Quote, I should have just went to the Rockies game that night. I think that's really important because I do think that that's what happened. If you listen to Christopher Watts' father-in-law's interview with the police, he said that his daughter came home, checked her phone on that receipt, you know, from the restaurant where Christopher Watts took his hottie on that Saturday night instead of going to the Rockies game. And then she confronted Christopher Watts. The person interviewing him corrected him and said, oh, you know, by phone. And he said, no. And then the person interviewing him corrected him again. And he said, yeah, by phone. Well, I think that's what happened. I think that's exactly what happened. I totally think that both Christopher Watson and his wife were fully aware and on board with getting a divorce. I think his wife was stalling him month after month after month. She was stalling him because she knew damn well that she wasn't making any money with those MLMs she had signed up for. I think she was stalling him, trying to keep him broke, trying to make it impossible for him to be able to get a place of his own. But I think when she found out that he actually was moving on with his life and that she actually was losing... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when she actually was figuring out that she was losing total power and control... I think she blew a gasket. Plus, remember, the girls had to be in daycare, according to Christopher Watts' wife, and they did not have enough money to pay the bills that month, and they didn't have the money to pay for daycare. And remember, she was going in for her first OB appointment 
15 weeks pregnant, supposedly. And she supposedly had high-risk pregnancies. And she was so carelessly not going in for prenatal care. What is it she didn't want the OB to find out? What about the ongoing family matter that was due to be heard in court on August 24th of 2018, just 11 days after the tragedy? So personally, I think that one sentence that Christopher Watts said to his dad in the car on the way to the police department, quote, I'll say it again, quote, I should have just went to the Rockies game that night. You think? You think instead of doinking your co-worker that maybe you should have been getting an apartment? You think instead of doinking all summer long, you should have been focused on protecting your daughters? So, in the interview, Ronnie says that his son, Christopher Watts, told him where the girls were at, and he said, Dad, I could not put them with her after what she did to them. And he said she was evil. I guess that would explain the weird choice of oil drums, right? And then they go on about how he doesn't cry. Ronnie doesn't cry. He's only cried twice in 20 years. Once at the memorial for the girls. And once when he was baptized. And Chris is the same, he said. And he said that's how he was brought up. And then he said, I'm sorry. I don't get this. There's nothing abnormal about whether or not Christopher Watts or his dad cries at all. In fact, just one or two generations ago, it would have been absolutely abnormal had they. Ronnie talked about how he couldn't see the kids. Or couldn't see the kids. Sorry, I'm on the wrong part of my notes. He couldn't see the kids in Myrtle Beach. We covered that. He talked about how he couldn't see his son, and he was told he was not allowed visitors at this time. So Ronnie started to go to the airport. Does that make sense to anyone? Why on earth didn't they get a lawyer in there? Why on earth didn't he tell his son to shut his mouth? Why on earth didn't he say, I want to see my son? Why wasn't he hiring a lawyer right then and there? Nope, he was on his way to the airport. And then they called him, evidently the court appointed lawyer called him and he went in and met with them and spoke with them in person. And then they didn't see Christopher Watts again. And evidently, I don't think they talked to him either until the night before the sentencing, the plea deal. And then they got to talk with him on a closed circuit TV for 30 minutes each. I think it was Ronnie, Cindy, and I think their daughter, Jamie, also got to talk to him. Part two. Let's see here. Ronnie said that they didn't get anything at all that belonged to the girls and that they did get Chris's jerseys and they finally got his wallet but they can't have his cell phone back because Ronnie says they were told that because of a People magazine article <laughs> yeah, really <laughs> saying that uh, Christopher Watts might be appealing his case they're gonna hang on to the phone it's been two years, you guys. I mean, come on, whatever. Again, why didn't Ronnie fight for his son's phone two years ago? Well, he explains it later in the interview because he says he's non-confrontational. <laughs> like that explains it all. Oh my goodness. He said that they asked the assistant prosecutor, what evidence do you have? That was the day or the night before the plea deal. And the assistant prosecutor said that Quote, we have a theory. So I guess Ronnie's trying to say that there's no evidence. And then they talked about the victim's advocate and how they did not agree with what she said with the victim impact statements that she made to the court. So let's see. He says we still love our son no matter what. 
and that it's hard to lose our grandchildren. And they talk pretty much every night, but sometimes he gets to call and sometimes he doesn't get to call. Let's see here. He said that they were told they couldn't talk about the case when they were able to talk to him before the plea deal. But when Cindy did say something like, if you didn't do this, don't plead, you know, the way Cindy tells the story. Right then, one of the lawyers jumped right up and used the F word and told her that the visit was over if she talked about the case. But the way Ronnie tells it, when she said, if you didn't do this, don't take a plea deal. Christopher Watts responded, Mom, I made my decision. And then Ronnie said that they were told, or that Christopher Watts said that he was told that it didn't make a difference really because if it was, you know, one or three, he said, because he would get life in prison. Well, I think it makes a difference if you didn't kill your family. Sure seems to me to be saying so. Sorry, just my opinion, but I think it makes a huge difference. Let's see. The plea deal was evidently to take the death penalty off the table, but the Watts were not concerned at all about the death penalty. And they said they've never received the DNA test results either. They were told simply that the father was Chris. And then Ronnie said that there's another person who evidently might be the father, and his name is also Chris. He said he was never interviewed at all by the prosecutor, never met him, never talked to him. He was asked why he thought that they, the investigators went up to Wisconsin, and he said... Or why did he talk to him, I guess? I don't know. And Ronnie said that Christopher said he thought he had to tell them something. So he just made up something to get them to leave him alone. Seriously? Because that stuff he was saying sounded pretty extreme. Ronnie was asked, what does he believe? happened and he talked about how at the police station Christopher Watts said to him dad I cannot or I couldn't put them near her after what she did she was evil and Ronnie said quote I believe it the 35C, oh, it's going to be a long, hard road. And then he said, if we can find the right person to defend him, a lawyer or whatever, to dive deep into the case. Really, Ronnie? Really? Because it sure seems to me that you are blowing your chances of ever getting a good lawyer to take on your son's case. And you know it. So what's that about? Obviously, if you wanted your son to have an appeal or a 35C motion or a lawyer, period, then at some point in the last two years, you would have hired one. So Ronnie was asked, what has changed? You know, what's up now? Why is Christopher Watts wanting to evidently stand up for himself now? And Ronnie said, well, you know, he was in shock for so long. You know, trauma, PTSD. It still hurts him every day. And then he said, it still hurts us every day. And he talked about the memorial setup that they have for the kids. And I can't read my writing. Let's see. I have no idea what I wrote. 
the channel creator said something about the channel up three weeks ago. And, you know, they're taking this deep dive. Yeah, bullshit. That channel creator has yet to say anything at all that's newsworthy. And, in fact, sometimes when she does talk, she gets it wrong. So what's really going on? I'll tell you what's really going on. There were high-profile law firms looking at helping Christopher Watts. Not saying he's innocent. Not saying that he didn't kill anyone but to make damn sure that he was afforded due process. And that's when the Watts family decided to start playing stupid games on YouTube. In over two years, I have never started to believe that this case was fake. But after what I've been watching in the last three weeks, I'm not so sure anymore.